Hi, everybody. Uh, welcome to another conversation uh, that I've been having as roundtables. Today's is with legislators about bills that were worked on and passed during this legislative session, which was a stretched session, mostly around COVID, but a few other issues as well. There was a huge amount of work done by legislators to figure out what the best allocations for the limited coronavirus aid, relief, and economic security funds uh, could be used for, also known as the CARES Act funds. Uh, this federal money was received, uh, thankfully, and it was directed to be used by the end of the calendar year, by the end of December, uh, and to be used as a response for the state to help with the economic fallout, as well as the results of the COVID-19 pandemic uh, to be used for economic recovery, healthcare recovery, and other impacts of the uh, COVID-19 pandemic. Joining me today to talk about how the funding was allocated and who it's directed towards so that folks can help understand if they're eligible or not and, and where the money has been prioritized to are Senator Jane Kitchell, who is the chair of the Senate Committee on Appropriations, Senator Michael Sorotkin, he's the chair of the Senate Committee on Economic Development, Housing and General and Military Affairs, and Representative Robin Chestnut Tangerman, he's the ranking member of the House Committee on Energy and Technology. And I want to thank you all for joining me. I really appreciate it. It's a pleasure to be here, David. Thank you. So uh, I also want to make sure folks know that uh, participation in this town hall does not necessarily represent a endorsement, uh, but we have tried to have a lot of folks on who have experience in what's happening around the state so that we can help share that with you. I'd like to remind those watching that if you have any questions or thoughts, you can post them in the comment section and we will try to bring them into the discussion uh, as we roll here. We're gonna start by discussing, looking at bill H966. This bill had over $213 million of allocations to support Vermonters, local businesses, and communities to help adapt to and overcome the challenges that we're all facing as a result of COVID-19. The bill has several important components, uh, but I wanna start by asking Senator Kitchell, who really, I just have to give her a ton of credit, worked so many hours through so many Zoom calls with so many different um, advocates, legislators, administration personnel to try to figure out how best to allocate these resources. And I'd like her to highlight some of the recovery grants that are included in the bill, if we could. So uh, Senator Kitchell, please. Um, uh, thank you, David. Uh, I guess I first start with say 1.25 billion sounds like a lot of money, but it's in uh, it's amazing how um, fast it can go. I, I do want to say that um, we uh, put a lot of uh, emphasis, H966 uh, is really focusing on um, the economic stabilization and recovery and provided assistance in a variety of ways, but particularly to um, a business stabilization, which also uh, uh, a major part of that was support to our agricultural sector, which um, was the first bill that, in fact, the um, Senate uh, passed and moved over to the House. So H966 ended up including um, some other uh, expenditures uh, that I think are particularly important that came in a, another separate bill, um, and that was local government. Now, I think one of the things the legislature looked at was other areas. The governor came forward with his proposals. There were two large ones. One was economic development housing, and then which included agriculture, um, business assistance, um, and then um, and then the other was on healthcare stabilization, which is not the topic of today. Uh, there are a couple of things that I would say is first of all. Um, the guidelines from the U.S. Treasury on permissible uses uh, turned out to be much more difficult to work uh, with than we first anticipated. Second of all, um, which was a topic of controversy, but we did um, have some unexpended, we've obligated about a billion out of the 1.25, but we wanted to have some money after July 1st because we know that other needs are going to emerge. Sometimes we found that the um, guidelines or the thresholds that were established for certain programs uh, needed to be adjusted. I think uh, Senator Surratt can, can talk about that in terms of the loss threshold for businesses. And this gives us some financial capacity to address the unknowns after July 1st. So I know there was a great deal of pressure and sometimes criticism of the legislature about moving the money out, but 
a couple of areas that uh, we and values that we wanted to talk about, and that is that there be equity, that there be geographic equity, um, equity across sectors, um, and also um, how we address um, needs that did not necessarily get articulated by the administration, but we felt were important. One was assisting local government. Um, our, our local towns have, um, uh, uh, for example, uh, police departments, law enforcement, EMS staff, um, maybe modifications. Just my little town of Danville, believe it or not, um, the extra cost of providing uh, portable toilets at our public beach. So there was no, uh, that was a separate bill that the Senate put forward and in the end it got incorporated. Another um, area that is in a set, another bill, but very ties very much into business and that was our hazard pay. And that came out, that was the first bill the Senate passed. And I have to say, personally, um, it turned out to be a disappointment because what we wanted to do was assist all workers who prim whose primary function was to face to face with the public and during the early days of the pandemic. And that would be real retail workers, sanitation workers, et cetera. And um, we ended up with a, a much smaller universe of essential workers eligible, um, mainly in the healthcare arena. Um, maybe the um, rules will get liberalized, that's our hope. But I guess I would have to say one disappointment was not to be able to provide uh, recognition to those line workers um, who are out there, many of whom were taking a great deal of abuse um, in the course of doing their work. The other disappointment, and it is part of the funding in this bill, is we had hoped to do more with broadband. Originally, we're, you know, my goal was, gee, it would be wonderful if we could put 100 million toward this and really move um, the state forward in terms of its goal of connectivity goals. Um, once again, um, the federal guidelines turned out to not be um, helpful to us, very, very limited. And in the end, we um, were able to allocate $20 million toward that end under certain conditions. But once again, um, a disappointment, I would say. Um, so permissible uses is um, a, a tough one. The other area that is not here in terms of this economic development bill, but I think is really important and something that has been a topic of discussion, and that is our publicly funded um, uh, higher ed. And uh, our state college system has um, was on fragile financial grounds to begin with, and the pandemic really exacerbated the situation. And so, um, in addition to the funding that um, uh, David referenced that came in 8966 was another 63 million um, to support higher education, both in terms of students, student assistance, uh, meeting the costs that COVID um, presented in terms of refunds. Um, so uh, I think sometimes we tend to not include higher education in terms of our economy, but our state economist talks about really the value, the uh, return on investment, the youth coming into Vermont, the money they bring, and it really is an important part of our economy. So the highlights, I would say, um, in 966 uh, would include, for example, the recovery grants uh, to businesses that was like $82 million. Uh, there was, it's turned out to be um, a topic of conversation and that was community lo uh, grants, community loan fund grants, and that was to uh, female owned businesses and minority owned businesses. Um, and maybe uh, that came from the house. So maybe Robin can speak more to that. Um, uh, Arts Council, local government was 15 million, but in total, uh, we also put in uh, other kinds of assistance to businesses, such as marketing support, technical assistance, um, and the list goes on. But housing certainly um, was, in the end, it gave us a great opportunity to really begin to make progress on developing capacity uh, for people in need of temporary housing and not rely on uh, motels, which has been a very controversial and not right. um, the preferred method. So. Um, 
some of what we tried to do was how we can use the money for the long-term benefit of the state. And that was also an important value. Um, so I guess I would say ag, um, 35 million, um, business stabilization, um, and Michael can talk to this, uh, was the 82 plus we had done uh, an additional 70 million in an earlier bill. So we've tried very hard to move the money out um, and do it in a way that recognizes and responds to a variety of needs. And, um, and then we did our first quarter budget, unprecedented, uh, to do two budgets in one fiscal year. So we have more work to do once we come back in August. So I guess that's kind of a yeah. summary from the <laughs> appropriations perspective. Yeah, it's hard to summarize hundreds of millions of dollars in six or eight minutes. But um, I know we're going to talk about broadband a little bit later and the housing sections a little bit later. But Michael, could I just ask you to speak a little bit more to some of the business support, some of the technical details? I know my office uh, has received calls from a number of sole proprietors who were expressing some concern. Um, but I also don't know that that was in the originally the governor's plans either. And so maybe just making sure the full parameter of some of these things. I know that Senator Kitchell talked about funding higher education in the state colleges as well. And again, my understanding was that money maybe wasn't in the governor's original plan. So while there was some charge from the governor with respect to how fast this was happening or, or doing his plan, there were pieces that were sort of missing and, and the legislature fixed some of that. Uh, Michael, but can you help explain some more of the business supports and workers too, potentially? And you're on mute, by the way. Some things <laughs> never change, David. Nope. <laughs> but we got you back now. Good job. Um, yeah, I would say one of the overarching process um, uh, situations that took place in the legislature is uh, when this CARES money was put on the table or received by the state of Vermont, in terms of economic recovery, the governor established several working groups to come up with a plan for the legislature to consider. I tried to inject myself into that process and uh, the governor's people basically said, no, wait, we'll get you something. Well, we waited for about seven weeks before they got something to us. And then they were suggesting that we turn that around, mark it up, accept it, amend it within a week's time, which is unheard of in the legislature for a program of this size, which we've never really faced in the past. We did our best to uh, get the money out the door as quickly as we could. And I think my committee had probably 10 days in which to work on it, and that's not even 10 working days. And we basically gave a lot of discretion to the administration to uh, implement a program with these funds. We did put some guidelines around the funds, but we worked as fast as we could to get something out the door. Uh, one of the cr uh, criticisms that you mentioned, David, was that sole proprietors who had no employees were not eligible to establish to apply for one of these recovery grants, which, uh, as is mentioned, uh, totaled about $150 million in grants. What we know from the administration at this point is they put a limitation on the grants of $50,000. To qualify, you have to show that between uh, March and uh, I think it's July of 2020, uh, you have experienced either a 50% or 75% reduction to a comparable month in 2019. But we asked the same question that you're asking of the administration, why did you leave out sole proprietors? And their answer, which we accepted for better or worse, was that there were probably about 30,000 businesses in that category that would have um, diluted the amount of money significantly that would be available for the rest of the businesses. Um, so they chose to leave those folks out with the understanding that those sole proprietors could qualify for two programs that actually are much more generous than what we had to offer here. And that is the PUA program under the unemployment system where they can get 
not only what their unemployment check would otherwise would have been, but also a $600 per week uh, benefit uh, for 26 and possibly 39 weeks. Uh, and also they could qualify for the PPP program, which is the payroll protection program established by the federal government, which has a lot more money available to it and is still in existence and is still looking for takers. So uh, that was a decision uh, that was made. Um, can you just but, give a brief definition of a sole proprietorship? Because uh, maybe not everybody who's, anybody who's not in business might not know what that means. Can you just describe that briefly? It's a one person operation with no employees that sets up shop like an acupuncturist or an artist or a, um, a hair salon maybe owns one chair or something like that. So okay. there's a lot of people that work that way and uh, they don't necessarily have to uh, get licensed or anything. It depends on their profession, but uh, uh, they file a income tax return as an individual and their business is their income. Yep. The sole proprietorship. Yep. Is that, does that also leave them sometimes a little more vulnerable, um, not having the cushion that some bigger businesses might have? But again, you mentioned that they do have potentially access to some of these federal programs. Who do they reach out to for either the PUA program? Uh, is that the Department of Labor? And has that been kind of a bumpy road for a lot of these folks? And or the PPP, that's well, through banks, right? The unemployment compensation program has been very bumpy. It's settling down now. I think uh, if you haven't applied for that program to date, it's a good time to apply because their staffing is up while the, the inquiries are down. So uh, the road should be smoother. They've worked out a lot of the kinks at this point. It has been hard. Uh, that is through the, the Vermont Department of Labor um, uh, online. You can file online for the um, PUA program. And the PPP program is run through the uh, any banks you may have uh, um, contact with. You could go to your local bank. You can also go to the uh, SBA, Small Business Administration. Uh, and if all else fails, you can go to Vermont Economic Development Authority, VITA, uh, and they will take your application. But I would encourage uh, sole proprietors, they'll probably wind up being better off than the limited amount of money that might be available through our state program. Right, Michael, thank you. And Robin, I'm gonna, um, Give you a chance to chime in on these issues we're going to get to broadband a little bit later but did you yeah. have any uh insights on some of the broader topics that senator kitchell and senator sorotkin were talking about or, or do you want to wait till to get into broadband yeah. i'd love to step back and just do sort of a couple of framing um, Great. statements and and one being um the in this process realizing very quickly that there is no top priority you know what people say what's the top priority there are 20 top priorities and and they all intermesh you know and it's healthcare it's business it's utilities it's um food distribution it's um you know they're they are workers there's no one single way workers exactly to to get the money out it's a it's a complex mesh of of interlocking systems and as part of that i was it was personally a disappointment to me but a, an education to realize how much of that money is funneled through institutions. The goal is to get it into the hands of Vermonters to relieve the, the needs. But as Michael was saying, you know, PPP uh, funding is done through financial institutions. And a great deal of the money is through financial institutions or hospitals or um, utilities or educational, you know, the state college system. And it's, it was just, uh, a wake-up call to me that so much for money to get to individuals, so much of it has to go through institu institutions first, or winds up in institutions. And but the biggest takeaway for me is actually how fragile the economy is. That how quickly so many Vermonters were one one paycheck away from homelessness or hunger or um, disaster of of some sort. Um, yeah. So those were just, you know, three takeaways from the, the discussion surrounding how best to allocate this money. And also, right. as Jane said, we could have used, you know, we could have easily 
allocated two billion instead of one. Sure. Yeah. No, it's true. And, and, and Jane talked about helping some of the municipalities. And one of the areas that I think folks are really wondering about is maybe where is the leadership working to push Washington where the Senate and the president have been really stymieing the bill to put more money to the states to cover state and municipal shortfalls because of the economic shortfalls, therefore tax revenues are down and states are gonna to have to start really cutting and municipalities might have to start cutting um, programs that are critical to, to our state residents uh, if those bills don't go through. And if, if again, some leadership around COVID-19 uh, was also directed by our governor of those same parties uh, to the Republican leadership in that Senate and the uh, president, that could help. Um, but in the meantime, we've had to fill those holes. One of the things that was in 966 uh, was a program called Everyone Eats. Uh, and I had a press conference earlier this week about it. Uh, it's modeled after the successful Shift Meals program. It started Skinny Pancake in the first weeks after the uh, shutdown began. Um, they started making meals at the time it was uh, nonprofit funded and distributing those meals with their employees. So they're keeping their employees working with PPP money, buying food with nonprofit funding and getting meals out the door. With that model, uh, the state has now come up with the Everyone Eats program that is going to be distributed across many local restaurants across the state to again, um, help those restaurants who've experienced significant downturn due to the COVID epidemic. And they're gonna be making healthy meals uh, and they're going to be um, distributing those meals, I believe around 18,500 meals a week through the end of the year by uh, keeping restaurants operating, keeping their workers employed, buying food, including a good percentage from local uh, uh, farms that actually used to sell to those restaurants and have seen that market dry up uh, to really expand the opportunity of having a single dollar go through multiple phases, which is also good for the economy, the multiplier effect, where the restaurant gets it, they pay their employee, their employee pays their bills, or they buy food from a farmer, the farmer pays their employees, to pay their bills, uh, and we get meals, 18,500 meals a week to hungry Vermonters. So if you are one of those folks who needs food, uh, you can work with food agencies and food support programs like Hunger Free Vermont to help learn about this. Uh, and it's getting set up all over the state. So that's very exciting. There's a lot in this bill um, that is uh, hard to fully comprehend or pieces you may not have heard about. If you have questions about those grants, uh, you can reach out to info at Zuckerman4VT.com and we'll help redirect your question to the appropriate person who can answer it in the administration or possibly one of the legislators uh, on this call or from your district. Now I wanna turn to another aspect that was in the 966 bill. Uh, that included millions of dollars. Uh, I thought it was maybe more, but it sounds like it might be about 19 million. Maybe it's up in the 30 or 40 million. And, and actually, uh, Representative Chestnut Chan Tangerine, you can actually help define both how much money and what it's being used for uh, with respect to broadband, being that you're the ranking member on a committee that I think deals with that issue across the state. Maybe you could talk about what the issue is, how do we get more broadband, what are the challenges, what are the opportunities with the new districts, and how that money is uh, gonna be used. Robin. Well, I think I could do that if we were going till eight o'clock tonight. Okay, but well, you try, try five or six minutes. I'll try five or <laughs> <to> six minutes. <laughs> um, so the, first off, you know, this uh, COVID-19 crisis has really taken what has been a, a slow moving crisis of, of connectivity, the, the digital divide, divide between those who have high-speed broadband, and those who don't, and tr changed it into an immediate crisis because as everything moved online, those who no longer had access to that um, no longer had opportunity to participate in uh, the economy, education, the democracy, healthcare, any number of things. And so it really became, the digital divide was the, the, the wall of opportunity between the haves and have nots. And part of the challenge of addressing this issue is that uh, by federal law, broadband is federally regulated. So what the state can and can't do, or can and can't require, um, is, is very limited um, because of FCC regulations. Mm -hmm. um, the other thing is that it's, even in the best of times, it's a slow process. 
you know, there are applications, there are reviews, there are um, studies for, for installation of broadband towers or, or uh, stringing lines on poles. Um, and the COVID money needs to be spent by December 31st. So we're trying to act very quickly, um, yet responsibly, and, uh, and as broadly as possible across a range of technologies and across the entire state. Uh, so that said, the bill uh, has a lot of different parts to it, or the, the act now. Um, and the first of, the, of these is about $18.5 million in various programs that is funneled through the uh, Department of Public Service. But the goal is to increase connectivity. And it does it a, a number of ways. And one is by helping to subsidize those people who have high-speed broadband going by the house but can't afford the connection. Maybe they live a quarter mile off the road and it would require some poles or uh, there's an underground connection required and it's, it's cost prohibitive. So this helps uh, share those expenses to enable new connections um, of, of high-speed broadband. Uh, another large chunk of it is um, for new connections expansion of service. And this is written to be uh, technology neutral. Um, we, overall, we have a goal of the, the, the speeds that fiber optic cable provides. But in this immediate crisis, we are open to any solution, whether it be uh, fixed wireless, mobile wireless, uh, fiber optic cable, um, regular cable, or, or even um, uh, DSL, paired DSL in some cases. Uh, <clears throat> so anything we can do to get to form these new connections and especially with a focus on connecting students who don't have access, connecting people in need of health care who can then access telehealth, um, and people working from home who otherwise uh, can't, um, are unemployed. So th those are the goals, the, the direct COVID-19 connections. Um, and, uh, and there are a lot of players in this. And, and it's the Department of uh, Public Service that is coordinating it. And some of the players in these are the, um, the communications union districts that were created last year by uh, Act 79. And these are um, essentially co-ops to provide fiber build out in underserved areas. Um, but again, the, these are community organized, community led, and generally volunteer led. So um, one of the things this bill does is to provide a little bit of money to help them with grant writing, with organizing, with getting off the ground to be able to respond to, um, respond to and access and utilize some of this federal money to make these connections. Uh, another big piece of the bill is $8 million. And this is for uh, people who are 90 days or more in arrears in their utility payments, which doesn't, so this is electric utility. It's not directly related to broadband, but it is affordability. It's, uh, we had some really unnerving testimony from electric utilities, particularly from the two poorest, most rural electric co-ops who said that um, those people who were at least 90 days behind in their payments, uh, the number of, of people 90 days in arrears had increased by almost 250%. And this was in early May. So with a couple of months since then, I imagine those numbers have increased dramatically. Um, the state put a moratorium on, on disconnects during the state of emergency, disconnections uh, appropriately, but that translates into losses for the utilities, which then translate directly into pressure for rate increases, which affects all Vermonters. So this program is to help uh, those who have um, really fallen so far behind in utility payments that they have no way of digging out of that hole without some assistance. And with this assistance, they can then allocate their money for food or transportation or the other uh, multiple needs that families have. Um, for some of those utilities, if I just ask, for some of those utilities, 
for profit and um, are you saying they have to have rate increases in order to meet their regular percentage profit for, for Wall Street? Or do they need to increase their rates to stay solvent and provide the service? So the, uh, the only, um, m most of the, the utilities are either co-ops or uh, municipal utilities with the exception okay. of Green Mountain Power, which is the 800 pound gorilla. And the amount of profit that they can make is capped in their, their agreement, uh, their, their rate setting from the Public Utilities Commission. So um, it doesn't increase their profit at all, doesn't, doesn't make excess profits. Uh, it's really more uh, afford viability so they can continue operations. The, the co-ops don't make a profit. They, they return any uh, profit that there would be to their, their shareholders, which is the, their rate payers. Appreciate that. Was there anything else you wanted to add on, on this uh, before I move on to the housing conversation and our house, hazard pay? We, we can leave it there and then see if any listeners have questions. Or, Great. Uh, yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Um, and as you all can hear, there's a lot of um, uh, topics here. And again, we welcome questions, reach out anytime. So I want to talk about housing for a moment. In 966, I believe there was about a $52 million allocation for housing initiatives. And again, those fall under uh, Senator Sorotkin's committee. And I'm wondering if you could talk about how some of these funds will be put to work to help Vermonters pay their bills and or uh, how the multiplier, again, their ability to pay their bills helps others pay. Um, or is there help for renters? And again, also, uh, Senator Kitchell, if there's aspects of this that you want to chime in after Senator Sorotkin speaks, that would be helpful as well. Um, so this is one area where I think we did exceptionally well in uh, trying to address the COVID situation. Um, even before the money was appropriated, the Department of Children and Families and OEO uh, in the Agency of Human Services took rapid steps to deal with our homeless population uh, in trying to address the, the preventative nature of uh, the homeless population spreading the disease or contracting the disease themselves. And we managed to house almost um, in its entirety upwards of 2,000 people um, uh, who are considered homeless in motels. Uh, and with that in mind, people realize that that might be a temporary fix uh, in terms of when and if the COVID uh, pandemic started to subside, where were these folks going to go? They couldn't return to church basements. They couldn't return to shelters that didn't socially distance. Uh, so people started planning for that. A good deal of this COVID money uh, that's available from the federal government for the states has been put into addressing our um, housing needs. And in a way that thinks longer term, and not just both both the immediate term, the immediate need, and the longer term uh, solutions. So uh, the first chunk of money, well, let me back up. The first thing that my committee did is we placed a moratorium on evictions in the state of Vermont and a moratorium on foreclosures. And we had that moratorium to continue until such time as the uh, emergency declaration stopped and in addition, 30 days after the emergency declaration uh, ceases. So yesterday, I think the governor extended the emergency declaration to August 15th. So if nothing else changes, uh, September 15th will be the first date where any kind of evictions or foreclosure procedures can uh, restart. So we kept those folks from being put out on the street and possibly infecting others and themselves and having a roof over their head. And then and thanks you to know, The legislature is going to return August 25th. So potentially, if this is continues to be a major challenge, the legislature may be able to act on that further, even if the extension is not made beyond that. Absolutely. Um, so I was about and I was about to say the next big step that took place in the housing arena, uh, Senator Kitchell deserves a large 
degree of the credit here is we appropriated $23 million quickly to the Vermont Housing and Conservation uh, uh, Board to look at what we saw in, in this process. There were a lot of old aging motels and other housing units that uh, needed to be potentially bought that could be easily refurbished to put in uh, small kitchens and stuff to provide units for some of our homeless population. So we understand that uh, that money got out the door sooner than the rest of the money and already in terms of a, a solicitation from VHCB uh, asking folks that want to sell or maybe develop these uh, uh, aging uh, motels that the, the outpouring has been tremendous in terms of the supply that may be available to help ho uh, ho house our homeless after the COVID uh, pandemic subsides. Um, so that's in the works. And then you talk about the $52 million that was uh, put out there in terms of 966. Um, there were two small uh, chunks of money, 550,000 to Vermont Legal Aid to help address um, eviction proceedings and counseling for tenants that may find themselves in threat of being eviction, as well as $250,000 on the other side of the equation to landlords that may need some help in navigating the judicial system. I've worked in this area in my former life. And believe me, if people can talk with each other, as opposed to going to court, that's far much better in resolving the problems. Um, another $9 million uh, was put into um, to the Housing and Conservation Board to help uh, uh, with converting homeless shelters. Uh, as I said before, they're not properly set up right now to allow social distancing, spacing requirements, and uh, that should be a very good useful uh, use of the money to um, uh, get people into, into housing once the COVID-19 uh, retreats. Um, there's $5 million to help people who are uh, uh, facing foreclosures. Uh, once that moratorium is listed, we know that there are a large number of people who are back uh, behind in their monthly uh, rents, and that's a need-based program. It, um, I think the income level is something in the neighborhood of $150,000 per year. Uh, um, uh, for someone to qualify, for a family to qualify for, for assistance. The biggest chunk of the money goes for $25 million goes to prevent evictions for people who are behind in their rents. Uh, even in the moratorium on evictions, there was a, a, a definitive statement that that does not relieve people of paying their rent and hopefully people were able to pay their rent uh, during the period we're presently in, during the moratorium period, but I'm sure there are people who have been unable to pay their rent, and this uh, $25 million will be available to uh, people to pay back rent. It's not an unlimited amount of money. The amount of monthly rent is capped. It's being administered by the Vermont State Housing Authority, and they have maximum amount of rents that they pay out to their low-income people, and that will serve as a default as to what the maximum monthly rental amount will be. Uh, in addition, what is not in this, uh, there's also, excuse me, there's also $6.2 million for what is was called the VHIP program. And um, my committee had gone around the state in the fall dealing with the housing crisis. And one of the things that we were very struck with by, especially in the Rutland area, there were a lot of old houses that, uh, that had four, fallen into disrepair that housed large families at one point that could easily with a little tender loving care could be turned into quadplexes uh, and be brought up to code and this is a, a public private partnership of 6.2 million dollars that will require a 10 percent match from a private uh, homeowner uh, to do the conversion and they would have a responsibility to keep the house affordable and keep rents affordable uh, for um, five years at least after the renovation. Uh, I would also note that in the, I just go back to the 
$25 million for rental uh, housing assistance that landlords have to agree not to raise rents for a period of time uh, if they get some back rent, back rent help uh, from that program. And um, uh, they also have to agree not to evict anybody for a certain number of months if they're going to take this money, unless, of course, the person falls behind in their rent again. Uh, so the last big piece here, David, is that uh, the Department of Children and Family, uh, Jane can correct me, I think it's $15 million of CARES money. It's not in this bill, but it's in a different bill. Uh, will provide the third leg of a homelessness prevention stool, which is services, um, and that's critical. So I think we have protected our homeless population, and hopefully we're going to produce enough permanent housing for the homeless population, of which I understand like 500 people are, are in family situations with children, um, that once, they, once this uh, virus is over, we will make a significant dent in our homelessness population in the state of Vermont, which I'm very proud of. And I thank uh, Jane and the Appropriations Committee for being great partners in this. Well, thank you. And, and one last arena that I really want to touch on, and it's been a topic that uh, I know you both and everybody worked on a lot, <clears throat> was the uh, essential workers. And as businesses and employees, uh, we've, and, and as customers, we've learned how much we rely on some of these folks, store clerks and others, as well as the health, um, healthcare essential workers and others. And really, they're exposed to more people every day, whether you're in the health system, whether you're in the clerk in the store, whether you're a, a shelf stocker um, to resupply the shelves for all of us to buy our goods. Uh, and they're exposed potentially every single day. And so there's some hazard risk. And um, I know that there was initially a, a real goal to get money out the door to everybody who were in those conditions. And I know, Jane, you talked earlier about some of the constraints of the federal law. Um, can you maybe start us off a little bit on what happened with hazard pay and who's now eligible in the end and maybe why? And then Senator Sorotkin or, or Representative uh, Chestnut Tangerman, if either of you want to add a little bit as well, um, if, if Jane doesn't quite get it all. But I know Jane is really aware and worked really hard on this. So Jane, could you help us with that? Um, sure. Um, I'll set my disappointment aside. The um, bill that came out of the Senate uh, would have covered about over 33,000 Vermont employees. These are individuals who um, were frontline workers in essential businesses. And during the first part of the pandemic, it was before the masks, it was before the plexiglass, it was before all the preventive uh, measures were put in place and they showed up at work. And there was concern also that they were working in jobs where maybe they were financially not at, um, um, as well off as individuals collecting unemployment with that $600 a week federal add-on, which was a 50, amounted to $15 an hour. So we're hearing from employers around sort of the, um, the importance of the work that um, these employees were doing and sometimes um, not where they were fiscally advantaged in any, um, in any form. So, um, in the end, we wanted to do everything from, I mentioned, from uh, the grocery clerks to the uh, clerks in the pharmacies to uh, sanitation and so forth. And we were really tying it into um, uh, the uh, list of uh, essential employers. So uh, as we moved on and the bill went over to the House, as it was passed by the Senate, it would, it would have covered over 33,000 of these employees and the price tag was um, to provide a benefit. And let me tell you, this benefit was very much targeted to get back to a point Robin made. These are benefits that would go directly to Vermont workers working under $25 an hour. So it was really gonna put money into the pockets of people doing essential jobs and not at, the, um, at higher wages necessarily. Um, in the end, because of guidance from the U.S. Treasury or lack of guidance or assurances, uh, we ended up um, 
having to reduce the eligible um, employees um, and pretty much essentially limiting to um, health care. Um, the only exceptions are crematorium and funeral workers, so which are not a huge number. So instead of 33,000 Vermonters uh, getting the benefit, um, that brought it down to 15,700 and reduced the cost by half. Um, those of us who worked on it in the Senate were eternally optimistic and we have language in the bill that um, says if we get flexibility and we can make um, this benefit available to these other workers, then we're all ready to go. We set up a mechanism to do it. It would um, provide uh, for those getting the benefit, working full time, it would be two thousand dollars, and for those part time, uh, was twelve hundred. Um, but nevertheless, there are many, many Vermonters, particularly providing care to our seniors or people with disabilities, that are um, uh, uh, going to benefit from this. And so, at least, it's a, a step forward although it is not as expansive as we had originally um, envisioned as we put the program together in, in the Senate bill. Um, maybe um, with additional federal funding, which we're hearing they're working on and hopefully um, will happen, uh, there'll be something that will um, recognize the risk and the work of, of these other employees. But right now, um, it's pretty much limited to healthcare workers. Um, the nice part is it goes directly to, uh, uh, to, the, to the employee, um, but it's also um, from our nursing homes or residential care homes, the uh, prospect of telling staff um, that something was going to be available, it may take a little time to have it come forward, um, seem to have been an important message your, that your work is valued and um, that that there would be some money that would recognize that that work effort that was um, went forward in a separate bill but in the end it got incorporated um, into I believe that ended up in the um, in the health care bill um, simply because of all the connections back to to the health care um, system so that's where we ended up. We're hopeful, but right now um, uh, disappointed in how it ended up. Michael, is that a good summary or did you want to add something quick to that before I throw one last little thought in that we got um, with respect to uh, some unemployment question? Well, I just, uh, David, I just put a, a, a little plug for something that I added to the hazard pay bill that is along the lines of the uh, the win-win-win situation you had about feeding local people with uh, local foods in restaurants, we charged the administration to investigate the possibility of giving the people who get hazard pay also a discount mm -hmm. card where they could use it in our restaurants who are hurting and the restaurants would match the fact that someone comes in with that card and give them at least a 25% reduction on their eat on their food bill uh, when they go in. And the restaurants are pretty excited about that. They need the customers going forward. So maybe that's not a win-win-win, but it's a win-win. <laughs> no, absolutely. And I want to throw one last little question in, and then we'll wrap up pretty shortly here. But uh, we got a question on Facebook from someone who had two part-time jobs. And one of them went online, and the other one, she lost their job. And so now she's working sort of half time with the online job, but isn't eligible for unemployment for the other half of her work because she's still working. Uh, is, is that a, 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 if the definition is correct of her situation, Michael, is that, is there anything that can be done for someone like that where they, they lost some of their work, but not all of it with respect to then having eligibility for unemployment? Well, I would definitely encourage that person to apply. They're not categorically ineligible. We have actually pretty good laws for people who lose certain hours and they get a part-time reduced benefit check, but they have certain income disregarded and certain income counted towards their calculation of their weekly check, but they should be eligible unless they're, they're just making too much money uh, to qualify even- First job. Yeah. yeah. 
Yeah. Okay. I'll, I'll make sure we follow up with her uh, on the conversation um, that happened on Facebook. So thank you. I just want to give everyone uh, a moment um, as we near the end of the program. Uh, we obviously can't cover everything. Uh, it's um, just so many topics to discuss and 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 um, figure out. Uh, so I want to thank you all and offer if there's just a one minute closing piece of something you really want to uh, offer um, and uh, and then we'll we'll uh, and then I'll wrap it up so uh, Jane you want to go first is there anything that you didn't get a chance to say or didn't hear that you really think folks should learn about well I guess um, the only thing I would reiterate is that we did not um, spend the full grant so there may be some opportunities to address um, areas that uh, are out there um, it's not a topic here, but certainly what is going to happen in our public school systems um, is really of grave concern as it relates to the startup of schools and uh, the impact that's going to have on higher ed as well. So uh, I guess I would say is these bills are a major step forward. We released uh, a tremendous amount of money. We've tried to do it in the most um, thoughtful and strategic way possible. Um, but needless to say, we still have more work to do, and um, uh, we'll be back in August to 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 um, uh, fi finish out this fiscal year. So it's an unprecedented time, and um, we are um, uh, hoping to be as responsive and as nimble as we can be. Uh, but it's been a challenge, let me tell you. So thank you. Oh yeah. <laughs> well, thank you, Senator Kitchell. Uh, Senator Sorokin, any last uh, little? Yeah, like of to, one of those bills. Yeah, yeah um, not on the bill, but the, similar to what Senator Kitchell said. I'm glad we're going back on August 25th. It gives us an opportunity to not only potentially spend the money that's been held back, but also to tweak the actions we've done. Uh, we've we there are some uh, uh, flexibility in the bills where money can be moved and eligibility can be changed. So uh, we'll have the benefit of two months of operation of seeing how these programs work. And it's a good thing that we're going back because we can make the programs better. Thank you. Uh, very helpful, Senator Sorotkin. Um, I should mention where people are from. Senator Kitchell is from Caledonia County. Senator Sorotkin is from Chittenden County. And uh, Representative Chestnut Tangerman, you're from Middletown Springs and a few other towns down in Rutland and maybe even a piece of Bennington County. Uh, Correct. Chestnut Tangerman, thoughts? Yeah. Um, yeah, I want to highlight a, one morsel that is in the bill, one that didn't make it into the bill, and, uh, and that reiterate that or agree with, with the others that are look forward to coming back in August and, and picking up where we left off with new information. Um, but one sort of un, unexpected um, impact of, of the coronavirus was having um, state employees work from home, which created thousands and thousands of new opportunities for cybersecurity threats to be introduced into the state system. And so this bill had a couple of million dollars in there for the Agency of Digital Services to ramp up cybersecurity for state employees working from home. You know, minor little piece, but of critical importance. Um, one piece that didn't make it in there was some money to try to uh, help speed up repair patch the uh, um, unemployment insurance program which encountered such difficulties in the in the opening months um, so these are ch challenges going forward um, and uh, and part of the the much larger picture that we will be looking at in August indeed the, the legislature will be returning August 25th to uh, as Senator Kitchell said take up the remaining three quarters of the year budget, look at what other expenses uh, have been incurred due to COVID-19 and, and the potential use of the remaining funds of the CARES Act, and whether or not the federal government moves to uh, add anything else um, to the opportunity for states to recover and rebuild uh, and even get through the, the situation with COVID-19. I also want to mention uh, schools were brought up a bit earlier and uh, my team is working on putting together a panel uh, 
in the coming weeks around the reopening of schools and whether schools should be open and what some of the parameters and expenses are going to be, but also what some of the need is, both for uh, making sure our kids don't suffer for lack of education opportunities, uh, but also uh, some of the parents who are trying to work and the juggle of that, but balancing that with public safety. And is it safe yet to have kids back in schools as we're seeing outbreaks right now down in Manchester and uh, down maybe in Londonderry and some of the other pockets around the state, as well as the, the ones around the country that are just um, unfortunately exploding with COVID-19. So this is an ongoing conversation. Uh, next week, we're gonna have a conversation, um, I believe around healthcare, uh, and so we look forward to folks joining us for that. I want to thank all of you for joining me uh, on this conversation, both the viewers, but also Senators Kitchell and Sorotkin and Representative Robin Chestnut Tangerman. If folks have questions, you can send them to info at ZuckermanForVT.com. Uh, and again, thank you to my guests and thank you for watching.